are right now. And that uh, precipitous decline has occurred over the last three years without the corresponding uptick of the kind of crime that one would think by people not being incarcerated. Although we're always on the edge of our seats about concerns of crime and where there may be hot spots, the correlation of that to state prison realignment, it's not there. Um, and we're watching that very, very carefully to see if it's this population. So we're advancing, I think, the noble goals of better reentry uh, into the city. Last year, I shut down a jail on the sixth floor of the Hall of Justice in the first time in its 58-year existence. On the sixth and seventh floor of 850 Bryant, it was all Sheriff's Department. It's jails three and jails four because of our undercrowding conditions but more importantly, because of how deplorable the conditions are on the sixth floor, I mean like condemnable conditions. Uh, I shut it down and redistributed uh, the jail population to the seventh floor, which has now put a lot of stress on that, and to our property in San Bruno, County Jail 5 in San Bruno. Um, I was able to redistribute some of our staff around, where then, with the help of, I think, uh, neighborhood leaders uh, and others, I want our deputies to be of greater assistance to the overall public safety goals in San Francisco. So uh, we enacted a pilot, which you probably heard something about, uh, with the Tenderloin and the Mission Stations called Station Transfer Unit, where I'm able to take some of the excess um, or some of the ability of our deputies who are not in the jail system to assist in the pickup of prisoners, those who had been detained by police, to Tenderloin admission stations so that it alleviates SFPD um, from not having to um, deal with that, um, you know, that requirement so that their attention then would be rerouted to more pressing needs. Uh, we're not asking for any money from the city nor the police department. Uh, I uh, negotiated the agreement with Chief Sir. Uh, it started on July 19th, so we're about two months into it. And knock on wood, it's going very well. When this concludes, this pilot, uh, in about January, uh, then I think the question is, do we continue uh, in the um, present uh, sort of pilot of two stations, or do we just not do it at all? Um, or do we expand it to maybe all 10 uh, district stations? I think we should expand it, but you know we'll have that policy discussion when we go before the Board of Supervisors, and that will require additional resources. We just don't have that, uh, we just don't have that surplus. But anything that we can do, I think, to assist, since our deputies are trained uh, very much in the same way, credential in the same way as SFPD officers in the larger goals of neighborhood safety and the hot spots. Uh, that continue to, I think, vex people, whether in the Tenderloin, Western Edition, Soma, Southeast Sector of San Francisco. Those are the um, strategies and philosophy that I press very hard for as a supervisor, like foot patrols. And when I legislated as a supervisor, the requirement of foot patrols in the Fillmore, uh, in public housing, and in surrounding areas, I received a fair amount of blowback. Um, for that, but I prevailed um, and when my legislation was vetoed by Mayor Newsom at the time, I delivered his first veto override as mayor uh, and got what I um, sought for practically two years and the crime rates plummeted uh, in the Western Edition in Fillmore after 20 years of significant homicide rates and violence, gun violence and other violence rates in the Fillmore itself. And then you could just see the incredible decline when we instituted forms of community policing. And a feature of that is community is foot patrols, but that's not all community policing. Community policing to me is about developing trust. It's about building uh, a level of integrity between uh, the public safety authorities and the community in which it uh, provides uh, that kind of uh, safety and security for, but really it's community driven. And, and that is a fundamental principle of philosophy that we believe in our department, the Sheriff's Department. And quite frankly, um, we are the ones who practice community policing. If you think about it, 
In the jail system, in our population today is 1,327. Our capacity is 2,450. Our deputies are trained up and down to walk the aisles and engage in the dormitories, depending on which facility, with the people that are in our custody. We talk with them. I eat lunch many times uh, with the inmates themselves, as I would with our own deputies, that we're trying to understand what is happening within the community. But it's more than just the small talk. It's about really developing a level of um, knowledge of where those people are coming from and that the relationship between them and authority, even in the, amid the experience of being uh, supervised while in custody. That's a level of community policing, too, that is often misunderstood when you have a captive audience uh, that I think you know, really can be used uh, to the benefit of both those that are in custody and those that are working uh, the jails themselves. Uh, that, um, that sort of approach uh, really is helpful to us, I think, uh, in being sought after by us expanding our operations now at San Francisco General um, and Laguna Honda, where we have jurisdiction for the public safety there. Now the surrounding community wants us to be doing more patrol, uh, getting involved in uh, the community issues that routinely have been SFPD, which makes total sense, but us to sort of cross-pollinate more together. So uh, this is a department that has quite a bit of range. It's law enforcement, but it's heavy on reentry and rehabilitation. The other side of it that people might know us for is on evictions. Um, the Sheriff's Department is authorized by statute to carry out evictions. Um, this is something that's on everybody's concern uh, about the high number of evictions that are taking place. By the time an eviction comes to us, we're the agency of last resort. And so um, if a court order comes to us from eviction, it's not that we have really any kind of ability to say good eviction or bad eviction. The expectation by the federal and state government is you carry out a court order, no questions asked. But we instituted something that is unique only to San Francisco. It's called the Eviction Assistance Unit. I want to know the people that were evicted uh, very potentially. And if they're vulnerable populations, especially people who are catastrophically ill, senior citizens, and families, etc., we send out people that are um, not in their deputy clothes, but civilian, trained in case management so that they can do an assessment that if people that are about ready to get evicted um, are going to be uh, come homeless or land on the street or put in some unsafe condition uh, that could only exacerbate their own and public safety itself. Um, no other sheriff's department in state does this, and we're not we're not charged to do it, so it's not like I'm getting funds from the Board of Supervisors and the Mayor to do it. We've rerouted some funds because what I want to do is try to de-escalate what can be a very, very um, explosive or high-intense situation, especially with such a large volume of evictions. We have called back hundreds of evictions, meaning I haven't acted on them, that I personally intervene in myself. Not that the evictions don't take place, but if I think, just recently, they wanted to, there was a court order to evict a 91-year-old woman. And I said, no, you're not going to evict a 91-year-old woman. Where is she going to go? So I had our people get on the phone with Adult Protective Services, got on the phone with Institute of Aging, got on the phone with a public guardian. We're not set up for this stuff. But we decided to take the extra initiative to go ahead and scout what resources they may be so people can rebound a little bit um, more easily and safely instead of us just doing what is routine in this country. Sheriff's departments just put an eviction notice out of your home, then they escort you out along with your possessions. Now, while that might be necessary, while people think that that eviction process should go unimpeded, we get that, but if it adds to the homeless roles or if it adds I think to the compromising of one's safety or security, and a lot of families these days, we also take note of this too. So um, that gives you kind of a snapshot of what's going on with uh, your sheriff's department. I'll stop here. More than happy to answer any questions you like.
David, you were eager. Uh, I really applaud your Stacy transfer unit, uh, Paul. I hope you can roll it out at all stages. I'm just qu I'd like to question what could be done to train the deputies involved to handle cases where it's a psychiatric issue or it's a mental health issue and the person they're transporting so they can be better able to respond to that. Our training starts in October. Um, again, we didn't get any funding for it, so what I'm using is uh, dollars away from some other training, which I find less uh, pressing for what is known as CIT training, critical incident training, which is 24 hours of training strictly dealing with somebody suffering with a mental illness or psychiatric episode. Um, sheriff's departments in this, in this state unless they're getting some infusion by their county governments or not given the dollars for this, rudimentary training is essentially an eight hour course that is during or post your academy. The CIT training is kind of the more platinum level of training, if you will, from the bronze level that they may be getting. Um, and we're starting with classes of 20 of our deputies. We have about 855 deputies. Um, and, <clears throat> And that starts in October. Sure. Uh, I guess my first question is the jail system. Uh, I've been through the jail system. Uh, I was in until 2008, and I haven't been back, thank God. But uh, I hope that what you're seeing here is a bunch of fluff, because I've been through the system, and the sheriffs are inhumane. Um, they're jerks. They're Nazis, excuse me, but they are real jerks. And I think that this plan that you've been proposing is still flawed because, I mean, even if you have a better looking jail, it doesn't make the people or the sheriffs any better. Um, the one asset that I'd like you to focus on in your jail system is the mentally ill that come into booking. Um, they should, one, be uh, segregated because being mentally ill, you're, you're naive and you can easily be taken, care, uh, taken advantage of. And the other is that they, I don't know if you still have that program on the seventh floor that was run by that one lady. Uh, it was a special uh, part of the jail that's for mentally ill. Mm -hmm. and is that still going? It is. Is it the same lady? No, it's oh. not. No. Okay. Well, I just figured that there should be more focus on people that come in and they should be more analyzed of their mental state, their physical state, maybe the HIV, hep, uh, hep C state, and that they should be more segregation, not as, as, as for a bad reason, but for a good reason for their own protection, and even in booking, it seemed like the sheriffs that were in charge of there could give a fuck what you say. And, and they don't understand if you say, I'm mentally ill, uh, you know, my life is in danger, and, and that's the other part I want to get to you about uh, when you're eating lunch with them. I mean, one, the meals are, are lacking in, in nutrients and in substance. I starve there. Everybody starves in jail. Um, I just think that if we could incorporate more better standards in the jail, I think that we would probably be get a better result from the treatment of the inmates. Because I've run into many people that have horror stories from being in that jail. I'm afraid to go to that jail now. For that one period of time that I was there. Um, Were you on the seventh floor of the hall? I, I had to work my way to the seventh floor. And my, my voice was being... Uh, even though I keep trying to get a hold, the, the, at least get to talk to the, sh the sergeant, because I thought at that time the sergeant was the person that I could trust, and the sergeant turned out to be. Were you ever at San Bruno? No, I wasn't. So that to me is a very stark difference. The Hall of Justice is going to be demolished in four years. You need to know that. that. Oh. Yeah, so I'm trying to catch you up. Okay. The whole building is coming down. Good. The jail, I, I shut down, as I said earlier, the sixth floor. Yeah. Those conditions, not even just the attitude. So the attitude of the inmates, no matter how nice or concierge-like that deputies can be, even in the conditions of the seventh floor, it's going to be a horrible experience. That place should be shut down. But we don't have the compensatory place where to put people. When I redistributed what population there was to San Bruno and to the seventh floor, we're now tight, as tight can be, because I yeah. shut down an entire jail. Yeah, what happened to nine? There's no nine. nine. That's building nine, one behind the Hall of Justice. That's women's. 
Oh, they turned into women? No. Yeah, that's what, that's what I'm saying. Maybe they could be part of that a mental health. Well, it is. Floor. It is. In fact, we have a specialized called CPOD. So when you're on the freeway going to the Bay Bridge, you see this fog color windows behind the Hall of Justice. That's yeah. our women's jail, and it's mentally for the mentally ill. And so if someone comes and says, I'm suck. mentally suck. Suck. <laughs> If I, if I say, don't put me in Gen Pop, I'm mentally ill and I'll be taken advantage of. Well, how can that be, how so can that not uh, affect me as for the Gen Pop, but just so they, I know that I can trust that they're going to send me to the right place and not lock me in a, in a well, safe cell? Let me answer your question. Okay. So related to what David asked me, that's why I'm putting our staff through training that they've never had before or in a very sketchy kind of way, spotty kind of way, known as CIT training. Mm -hmm. And that starts with our booking process. It also regards our deputies that are on the streets, like a station transfer unit uh, and others. For all the inroads, and this isn't fluff, the, the math is a lie. The math is the math. Mm -hmm. And so I'm dealing with concrete, tangible numbers, which is why I think it's important community should hear from their sheriff. Yeah. Because whatever picture you may have, the, the routine experience that you would have heard several years ago in San Francisco, as well as around the state, is it's all at overcrowding. Mm -hmm. So people just assume jails are at overcrowding. This is a little bit of a phenom that's occurring where we're so undercrowded in the age of state realignment, it's got people like wondering what's going on here. Mm -hmm. So we're just finding that those that need to be incarcerated, and it's not perfect to say the least, are probably needing to be incarcerated and finding those that don't be, do not be. But I also reject, speaking of mental illness, that I do not think that the jail should be substitute for mental health asylums. I think, well, I, 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 I disagree, because I think that if you're mentally we're not Ill, set up. I know, but if you're mentally ill, you shouldn't be treated badly because you don't know what's going on. I don't want to treat badly. What I'm saying is that criminalizing somebody for mental illness the jail system is not going to be able to do anything more than triage or keep you off the street. Right. Technically, this is, a, this is a collective failure that we now have five times more beds for mental illness than SF General. If you think about it, SF General should be the ones that have five times more bed than I've us. There. I've been there also. Well, so you have your own personal experience of speaking about, but I'm looking sort of at the master experience that people that have mental illness, while I know it's an understanding reflex, like get them off the street and put them somewhere until they commit a crime or what have you, depending on the seriousness of it, just simply putting them in jail has been the common reflex in this country, state, and city. And when we're seeing uh, dips in our jail population, considerable decreases with everybody but mental illness, then this is not the right trajectory. It will continue to happen, but as long as people are being criminalized for being mentally ill, we're not, we're not taking care of the problem. We're simply making the problem go away on a temporary basis. Because in county jail, everybody eventually gets out. Your stay might be wow. a little bit longer, it's true, and everybody does get out. Eventually, you all get out, and if you're getting out, then our goal is to make sure that while they're within our care, we do everything we can to assist but them. it's not cruel and unusual. It's not cruel and unusual. We have another all. question over okay. here. Yeah. Actually, should back here, too. Um, so, okay. so I, I know that housing in the city, um, and I'm, I'm Karen Drucker, I work for Tunnel and Housing Clinic. Um, I know housing in the city is one of the biggest crunches, um, and, and I, my understanding is that probation does um, assist people with, with rent for housing after they re-enter. Um, my question has to do with how uh, the probation department is able to, and correct me if I'm wrong, you are, you are over probation set. No, we're separate. You're separate from. It is the sheriff, I'm constitutionally elected, so uh, that's why we're very different than police, that's why we're different from probation. The chief of police is appointed by the mayor, the chief of adult probation is under the domain of the mayor. We're elected. So the constitutional division is very different. Those people don't understand the difference. Sure. Are there any programs funded through the Sheriff's Department that provide housing? For we folks? do. It's called NOVA, okay. the No Violence Alliance Program. So, so programs under that NOVA umbrella would fall into your jurisdiction? It does. But what has made things very strained is the lack of housing. 
in the city. So you have to imagine that for our population, which many would think is kind of the most unsympathetic populations, no matter what um, magic they do for themselves or we're able to do with them to prepare themselves to release, they're being released in one of the most cost prohibitive cities in the country. So to have that ability